So one video away from the reveal of your amazing Halloween costume. And I can't believe we got one on such short notice. Mm. It's really lucky for us, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, let's continue. With the internet currently losing its shit about the upcoming holiday of Halloween, as it is wont to do, we thought we'd take a minute to talk about how the guy who played Pinhead in the Hellraiser movie was really good at applying his own makeup. I know this is going to hurt. Okay. But there will be people out there, younger viewers, who may not know who Pinhead is. Yeah, that's a depressing thought, but for those people who don't know who Pinhead is, because, like, you know, you're too young, or you're not cool enough to have watched those movies, Pinhead is a horror movie icon from the 1980s, and I think the 90s only had a few movies there, who stands alongside the likes of Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, and Freddy Krueger. You know, one of those, like, iconic villains who fuck people's shit up in increasingly shitty movies. I am the way. Why is it horror of all genres that gets the most sequels to its movies? Because my working theory is that they're so cheap to make and that people who watch them don't really expect much from them. You just want to see like teenagers getting their shit rocked and a guy with a big knife and a boiler suit walking around. Well, every review I now see of any new Saw movie says, if you're a fan of Saw, you'll like the movie. And it's like, well, you know they're literally there to watch people get ripped apart. Yeah, and they cost so little to make. Oh, you don't have to hire any big name actors, because why would you? They're going to get killed. So you just hire some no-name actor who'll work for scale and think of a way to kill them. That's as gruesome as possible. Put in a few shitty jump scares, bish bash bosh, job done. $40 million at the box office on a $5 million budget. Okay, so I think we're beating a dead horse by saying there are horror movies that have had too many sequels made to them. But, here's the inverse. What horror movie hasn't had enough sequels made? Because my money's on Final Destination. Because I would watch a Final Destination movie every day of the fucking week. If they released a new one of those every three months, I'd go watch it. Because those things are always amazing. It would be amazing if they kept trying to trip up the audience. They bring back Sean William Scott. <laughs> One of those He's things. The first one. Oh my god, that's He's the guy who gets his head knocked off by a train. That's great, put the clip in. You're dead! You're dead! <laughs> and now put a clip in of like Stifler. Well, polish my nuts and serve me a milkshake. <laughs> Moving back to Pinhead, although he does share many similarities with the characters we've just talked about, he stands out as a fairly unique example of a horror movie icon. So why is that? Well, unlike Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees, Pinhead isn't a mindless killing machine, and unlike Freddy Krueger, he's not a child molesting maniac. Yeah, they kind of walked that back in the later movies, didn't they? The whole thing about Freddy Krueger being a, a big old child molester, big old kiddie fiddler. That reminds me a lot of the way they dealt with uh, Theodore Bagwell. Oh, you mean Teabag in Prison Break? Oh, man, I've been watching Prison Break recently, actually, and I've noticed that because that actor, I think it's Robert Neppel, I think his name is, is fucking amazing in that role. And he's so charming as, like, like Teabag. But the problem is, in earlier episodes, because they didn't realise how good an actor he was or how big a role they wanted to play in later seasons, they just like, oh yeah, he's super evil, he's a white supremacist, he's like a rapist, he's murdered people. And I think in one season he fucking straight up eats a guy. <laughs> he's like a cannibal and he plays it for a joke. Hey, what's wrong, man? Eat some bad Mexican? Something like that. It's like fucking hell, T-Bag. And I think as well, in the latest season, he has a robot hand. <laughs> That's how bad Prison Break gets. We talk about things getting too many sequels. Prison Break, in the fifth season, T-Bag gets a robot hand. <laughs> They give, like, a child molesting rapist a robot hand and you're like, yeah, go fight crime, T-Bag. I am definitely right now cutting together the clip of him first getting his hand and then Moss walking past going, I'd have used my robot hand for good. Totally do that. I'd have used my robot hand for good. <laughs> So how is Pinhead different from those other slasher icons? Well, unlike Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Leatherface, he's portrayed as being articulate and well-spoken, more akin to Hannibal Lecter or Dracula. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. The decision to make Pinhead a well-spoken and articulate villain was a deliberate one on behalf of the movie's creator who felt that a smart villain was infinitely more scary than a dumb one. So why did he say that a smart villain is scarier than a dumb one? Because a smart villain knows that they're hurting you and they just don't care. That's why, like, you know, Dr. Hannibal Lecter is so terrifying because he's smart enough to know that he's doing wrong, 
but he does it anyway, as opposed to someone like Leatherface, who's got like, the mind of a child, and he's just doing as he's told. Like, you can kind of feel sympathy for that villain, because it's like, oh, he's a product of, like, you know, his upbringing or some shit like that. You can't say that with Dr. Hannibal Lecter or someone like Pinhead. They've got, like, they've got the intelligence to know what they're doing is, like, you know, morally wrong. They just don't give a fuck. And that's somehow, that's even scary. It's like when it hurts more to get kicked in the nuts intentionally by another man than it does when someone throws a remote control across the room and, ha and accidentally dings you in the nuts. It's like, the knowing makes it hurt more. This all said, Pinhead does share at least one similarity with the character of Freddy Krueger, in that they've both been consistently portrayed by the same actors on screen, Doug Bradley and Robert England respectively. How many Hellraiser movies actually are there? There are 10. Wow. Yeah. And there was one released as recently as 2018, in February of this year, I believe. Because of course, why would you not release a horror movie in February? You know, the spookiest month. That's how, you, that's how bad it is. And understandably, Doug Bradley is not in that movie. And he's not in the one before that, which I believe was made in about three weeks because they were going to lose the rights to the Hellraiser name, which is always a good sign. And they asked Doug Bradley to be in it. He went, nah. Fuck it, I don't want to be in this one. It looks like shit. So that was already a bad sign. If he'd appeared in the first eight, and you can't convince him to appear in, like, you know, the ninth one, someone's already a miss. And it was so bad that the original creator, Clive Barker, went, yeah, this movie sucks. And when they put his name on the poster saying, from the mind of Clive Barker, because obviously it's inspired by his universe, he went, it's not from my mind, it's not even from my asshole on Twitter. <laughs> and then the 10th one, they asked Doug Bradley again, come back, play Pinhead, and he went, no. Because he said, I want to read the script because the last Hellraiser movie sucks all kinds of balls. I don't want to get burned and be in another shit movie. Bear in mind he was in Hellraiser 8. They wouldn't let him do it without signing NDA. So he said, no, fuck it, I'm not being in this movie. So he didn't appear in 9 or 10? No, but both of those movies are shit, so I don't think they'd count. Although I'm a bit disappointed that he didn't appear in them in some capacity. He said he'd have like, you know, a 10 movie streak playing Pinhead. And if he appeared in just one Hellraiser movie, he could have got himself an AC-130. <laughs> That's a joke for all the Modern Warfare 2 fans out there who I know are watching this video. Oh, then, man. then again, if he had Hardline, he could have done it in the 10. Oh, he could have done it in 10, couldn't he? Thing is, though, what, you know, perk setup in Modern Warfare 2 would Pinhead use? Because I think we all know that like, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Leatherface would all use Commando Pro because they're all melee weapon users, aren't they? It'd also make, that'd make them so much deadly. Because the, amount, the <laughs> distance you cover with Commando. How deadly Michael Myers, <laughs> Freddy Krueger. No, no, Freddy Krueger, does he stab people? Um, he well, probably, he, he just probably, various you know, he'd probably use Ninja and like Scrambler and that shit, wouldn't he? <laughs> no, and then, but the thing is, Pinhead though, he'd have one man army and Danger Cloaks. He'd be that dickhead with a noob tube firing it across the map. Because he's got like all the Cenobites on his team, hasn't he? He's that dickhead. He'd be the guy who's in like the MLG clan who plays like all the other like top level people. Because he'd have all his Cenobites on his team. <laughs> and then he's got the team of Michael Myers, the Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees and Leatherface all running around like dickheads with Commando Pro on. <laughs> just jumping off buildings, doing 360s and just doing 40 foot knife stabs. Getting back to Pinhead, understandably after appearing in eight of these fucking movies, Doug Bradley got kind of good at applying the iconic Pinhead makeup. Surely they would have had some makeup artist to do it for him. But to apply the pinhead makeup? Yeah, they did in the first couple of movies, but they replaced the makeup artist between films. They didn't replace Doug Bradley. And because Doug Bradley knew how the makeup was applied, he eventually got so good at helping them apply it, he got a makeup artist credit in the third and fourth movie. Because he said, fuck it, I can do it myself, it's quicker if I do it. Because obviously he sat in that chair and had it put on so many times before, whereas like the makeup artists they brought on for those movies were doing it for the first time. It's like, oh, don't worry, you can sit there and collect a paycheck. Just go put some more poor powder on that person's nose. I'm going to put these fucking needles into my eyeballs. Out of curiosity, why is he covered in pins? Well, the comics go into it in a bit more detail, but from my surface level understanding of the Pinhead cinematic universe, it's uh, something to do with the fact that Pinhead and all the Cenobites worship some weird religion where pain is seen as like the ultimate form of expression or pleasure or some shit like that. So they all exist in a like perpetual state of agony which is why all the Cenobites are like basically walking in like torture gear all the time. And it's why all the people in the Hellraiser movies get really fucked up. <laughs> because, oh my, do people get fucked up in these movies? 
while we're talking about the makeup of Pinhead, fun fact, that makeup obscured Doug Bradley's actual real face so much that when he turned up to the premiere of the first Hellraiser movie, he got really despondent and upset when nobody there would talk to him, despite the fact he'd been working with them for months. And it wasn't until he pointed out, like, yeah, I'm, I'm Pinhead, I'm the main character in this movie, he went, oh shit, sorry, I've not seen you without your makeup on. And he went, oh, is that why everyone's been an arsehole to me and no one knows who the fuck I am? And they're like, yeah, kind of. And he's like, oh, that kind of makes sense. I thought people were just being dicks. So if you decide to cuddle up with someone this Halloween and watch some old horror movies, if you decide to watch the third and fourth Hellraiser movies, it may amuse you to know that before Pinhead filmed many of his scenes, he probably spent an hour doing that annoying mascara face in the mirror while applying his makeup. Because it's Halloween in a few days, Brad, and because modern horror movies tend to be a bit, well, shit, are there any older ones that you'd like to recommend for the people at home that they may not have seen some more obscure ones? So I want to like, you know, start off with Wishmaster. So if people, like, if you're a big fan of like, you know, gory horror movies and you want to see some sick, awesome, practical gore kills, watch Wishmaster. So the idea is Wishmaster is this evil genie who grants wishes, it's like a monkey paw wish, where you wish for something and it always goes wrong. And the first wish in the movie is, I want to see, I want to see wonders that have like never been seen before. And the Wishmaster makes a guy's skeleton leap out of his body. And it's fucking brilliant. <laughs> Does there any movies like that you want to recommend? Well, when I was a kid, I remember one of the movies I was always scared of. We called it The Stairs on Fire. I hope oh, that's the title. <laughs> no, the actual, that's not the title, I'm really pissed off. The actual title is The Changeling, and I think they might have remade it and it was shit, but the original Changeling was one of those ones where your, your mum puts it on for Halloween because she likes it, even though you're too young to watch it. Yeah. And I always remember getting really creeped out by that. I think one that always got me is Arachnophobia, which oh, I God, found yeah. out recently is supposed to be a black comedy. It's supposed to be a comedy. And it's terrifying, because I'm scared of spiders. If you're scared of spiders, watch Arachnophobia, or don't. It's like, imagine if they made, like, snakes on a plane, but Samuel Jackson wasn't in it, so they didn't care about killing the main actor. <laughs> That's how fucking bad it is. Um, another one I recommend is Deep Rising. There is a terrifying moment in that film, it's a giant evil octopus is attacking a boat, and it digests a guy, and they shoot the octopus and he falls out of its stomach, half digested, and it's fucking horrendous. <laughs> so I recommend the film Virus, which is about an evil space virus that gets beamed down via a satellite and turns a ship full of Russians into evil, like, goo robots. It's cool, watch it. Pretty amazing. What was no head and all. I'd like to recommend. Um, there's a film called Session Nine, and there's two reasons for this. One, I believe it was inspiration for one of the Silent Hill games. Okay. Um, but two, because David Caruso is in it in one of his in one of his only other roles aside from Horatio. No, don't, don't forget about Rambo. And Rambo. He's yeah. in the first Rambo. <laughs> he gets his shit rocked by Rambo. And uh, he's also what's that one where he's in where he's um, silent? It's Hudson Hawk. He's oh, in Hudson yes. Hawk as a mute. In session nine, there is one clip where someone says something to him, and as this person's walking away, the camera cuts to David Crusoe and he says, Hey, fuck you. <laughs> and as he says, the camera pulls in on his face. You know <laughs> what? I feel like that's the clip we should end on today. There we go. Hey, 